Hey lovelies, welcome to Conversations with Serene. This month's topic is all about nurturing a new you. I am so excited to share with you my favorite person on this topic, Jessica Stephanie Dabrowski. She is a shaker and mover in her field, literally and figuratively. You'll see her dancing it out on her Instagram page, and you'll also find her supporting you as you reprogram your thoughts to learn to love yourself. So let's get to it. Hello and welcome to Conversations with Zareen. During the next 45 minutes, you are invited to listen to leading wellness experts, influencers, brand builders and entrepreneurs who will help you lead with light, build with love and grow with gratitude. Their secret hacks that make life a better experience for us will be reconnoitered and brought to you by your host who is a certified holistic health coach, a registered yoga teacher from the Yoga Alliance US, mother of three and a passionate doTERRA wellness advocate. Her calling to help people and the community made her leave a 15-year engineering career and embraced the path of giving by creating wellness entrepreneurs. And now, here's your host, Zareen Bharda. Hey lovelies, this is Zareen. Welcome to today's podcast on Conversations with Zareen. Here today, we have Jessica Stephanie Dabrowski with us, whom I had met through Instagram last year, where she is an absolutely amazingly beautiful soul and great anxiety relief coach that can support you on your journey to change your lifestyle habits in order to break free and live a happier and more confident life. With today's conversation about nurturing a new you, we're going to talk about supporting you in different ways to nurture yourself and also make it sustainable. It is now March, and I'm sure a lot of us that had made resolutions or changes for the new year may find them slipping and getting back into our old ways. Well, we've got you. We're here to get you back on track and continuing your journey to nurture yourself to break free and live a happier and more confident life. So Jessica, I'm not really someone who Googles people as I prefer to take them for face value. And I base my relationships with someone based on the interactions that I have with them. But I figured since I'm going to be doing the podcast today, I should do a little further deep dive into who you are. So what I found out is all of the amazing work that you do on Instagram, your website, your podcast and your workshops, which are already something I knew. And that's something that I absolutely loved. And that's kind of what drew me to you. So Hmm. I guess for our listeners out there, what does an actual anxiety relief coach do? Um, Yeah, so that's a really good question. Well, first, I just want to thank you so much for having me on your podcast today and for doing this interview. I'm so excited to have met you through Instagram some way, somehow. I don't know how the universe brought our accounts together, how we ended up following each other. Um, but we've already collaborated in so many ways since then. And yeah, it's, I think it's amazing how the universe can bring people together and the internet like allows for that connection as well. And anxiety relief coach, that's a, that's a funny question you ask because I kind of came up with the name of the coach or like my title, I guess you could say myself, um, because like life coach just didn't seem like the right word. And Um, and also, you know, like wellness coach or something didn't really seem like the right word. And what my, my focus really is on, or at least how I've started out is focusing on helping, helping others break free from anxiety that's holding them back from living their life to its fullest. And that's something that, that I had done. Um, and I do more than I do more than that. And you said, so in the, in the intro, I do, um, a lot, a lot of healing for others or help others heal in other ways, like through reprogramming their thoughts to learn how to like love themselves. And there's a lot of work I do on myself and with my clients for their self-esteem, digging into their childhood conditioning, uh, digging into trauma with certain clients, digging into so many other things, but anxiety, the reason that I chose, I guess that word or why that is kind of like the center of the work that I do is because it's a symptom that's really, really visible, or at least it can be invisible, but it's really strongly felt. 
right? And so it's something that a lot of people identify with in terms of like a mental health struggle. So thoughts kind of ruling your mind or the physical symptoms of anxiety, like nausea or digestive issues, or just stress stored in the body, chest pains, different types of like breathing and and heart irregularities because of storing so much stress. Like these are all symptoms of anxiety that people can, can feel, but just overall, I, I have realized for myself that anxiety was just like one manifestation of a lot of things underneath the surface that needed healing and that needed attention, if that makes sense. And I think anxiety relief coach just is, is something that a lot of people can identify with overall. Although overall, I consider myself more like, I call myself more generally like a coach and a healer because I do more than that. Right. But what a lot of people come to me with is this struggle with anxiety interrupting their life, interrupting their thoughts, taking over their emotions, taking over their body, and it being like a block for them to be able to enjoy their life, to be able to like make memories. Um, and so, yeah, that's why it's, I guess, the title I chose or how I identify because it's a journey I've been through. And it's something that a lot of people come to me with. And I guess what I would call my my specialty. That's awesome because anxiety is pretty much the perfect word for that. And it's very common, I would say, like where if you mm-hmm. tell someone, okay, I'm having a panic a panic attack or mm-hmm. I'm overwhelmed, automatically like you associate with anxiousness or anxiety. So I think being an anxiety relief coach is the perfect combination of words to mm-hmm. basically heal someone or coach someone along that journey to support them. So I guess what led you to becoming a healer and a coach? Yeah. So actually just last year, I was still in a PhD program um, in oceanography. So the study of like marine sciences, ocean sciences, chemistry, and I was on track to become a professor in earth sciences. I was in a, you know, a very prestigious kind of program at uh, MIT or the Massachusetts Institute of Technology partnered with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in the U.S. And I, I was on this track. I was in the, the academic, uh, in the academic world on track to become a professor and something that I was going through at the time. So just a couple years prior, just a year prior to me starting that PhD program is when I would say I hit my, I guess, not mental health, like rock bottom, you could call it, but also just this turning point in, in my life. It's when I kind of woke up to a lot of the things that I was struggling with, or was able to put names to it. Um, and that happened after my dad had passed away. And so he was, he was an alcoholic for my whole life. And he passed away when he was just 48 years old at, during my last year at university, just before I was starting graduate school, starting my PhD program. And I had, I had realized that I was going down a really similar path to him. Um, I was was drinking a lot more than than I would like. I saw myself just as unhappy as he was and hating myself as much as he did and finding it really hard to get out of bed and like and to go to work and and to do my research. And I found just my days being ruled by anxious thoughts, being ruled by, well, I'm not doing enough. I was constantly on this like hamster wheel of burnout and overachievement and and just anxiety was taking over my whole life and and my my dad was never you know diagnosed with with what i would say is like anxiety or like clinical depression or something like that but now being on the other side of it i know that's what he had and he was using alcohol to like get through it and cover it up and i saw myself like going through a lot of the same um a lot of the same things but numbing myself in different ways. So, you know, there were moments when I drank, was was drinking to get rid of stress, but there were other times when I was coping by controlling my food intake or I had disordered eating patterns or just by working. I would fill my time up and try to get away from my anxious thoughts and unhappiness by by working a lot. And that's that's why I was basically thriving in the academic world and in in becoming a scientist and a professor, 
because it was a really great way for me to like funnel my energy and to not think about myself. Um, I just overachieving was my, was my way to cope with, with unhappiness. And I thought, okay, if I get more awards, if I get this prestigious PhD and I have all of this, like that's going to fill the hole within me, but that hole was still there. And so during grad school, I realized like, Hey, I have all this stuff. I have a, I have a partner. Um, I have, um, I have this PhD program. I have friends around me, but I still feel so empty. I still am struggling with anxiety. And that's when I started, um, when I was like, I guess, diagnosed by a, by a therapist saying that I had high functioning anxiety or what you would call like generalized anxiety disorder. And I was like, the hell, but like everything seems so perfect on the outside. I have straight A's. I have a PhD, like I'm getting a PhD. I have friends. I have all this, but that didn't me didn't mean that I wasn't struggling. So as I started to do more research myself about it, because I had a very scientific mind. So I was like, oh, I need to find out more about this. And when you start realizing that the symptoms that you have are anxiety, like Google becomes something you turn to, right? Just when something feels so unknown. Yeah. And I started realizing that over 40% of other graduate students, other PhD students also struggle with anxiety and depression. And I was like, what? I'm not the only one. And then in the US, the statistic is like one in five adults will have an anxiety disorder that's like diagnosable in their lifetime. Although I don't think you have to be diagnosed to identify with like the struggle. And it, that, that was like the, a big moment for me. I was like, I can't live this way anymore. Um, I need to find a way out. And so during those first couple of years of grad school, I did a lot of work, research, learning, trying a thousand different things on my own um, and actually started to break free from that shell of anxiety um, and and doing it. For me, it was really powerful to do it without um, without medication because in high school, I was actually put on hormonal treatments because um, my mom thought I was bipolar and doctors thought I was bipolar, which, which was not true. Um, but I had so many terrible side effects because of that. And I was, I was just like, I, if I can do this without taking a medication, not that there's anything shameful about it, but just, I had bad experiences with it. And I knew a lot of friends who had bad experiences with medication. And so I was like, I need to figure out a way to do this. And so I started le learning so many different holistic techniques and basically flipped my lifestyle upside down. Um, and then I decided like, I, this is what I'm meant for. I'm meant for doing this with other people too. And even when I was thinking about the job of becoming a professor, what I, I wasn't picturing like being in a lab and doing research or standing in front of a classroom and teaching the, the vision that I would always see in my mind when I closed my eyes and thought about being a professor was sitting in my office with like a, a kettle or a pot of tea, like ready to go and like snacks and, and students would come into my office and share like what they were going through. And I would help guide them either through like career changes or through whatever was going on with their family, because I didn't have a lot of family support when I was in college. I mean, I had a very dysfunctional family, so I was, you know, I was forced to be very independent and I wasn't very well supported. And I was like, I want to be that person for other people. I want to be that guide. And then I realized like, hey, that's my calling. My calling is to be a guide for others and to help others heal and figure out their way in life and to get out of the unhappiness that they are in, just like I have. And it's not to, you know, teach science or do research, although I still love all that stuff. And so that was my very long-winded way of answering your question. But I think all parts of those journey, that journey is important to share because it wasn't, yes, there were some key moments, but it was, it, it was kind of like, I guess, a, a domino effect of, um, after my dad had passed away, I was like, that, that was, that was a turning point. And then it all added up to me finally taking the jump and quitting my PhD program. I left with a master's, um, last year and went full time into being a healer, being a coach and, um, being, being that light for others because I felt a calling to it. That's amazing. That's amazing. And I'm sorry that you had to experience all of that trauma at such a young age. And that's where I think if no one has Googled generational mm -hmm. trauma, 
definitely do it because this is a huge yeah. thing. And this is things that can be passed down for generations or things that even in utero where you may not have actually experienced it yourself. It can be passed down through your parents or through your grandparents. Yeah. Um, and it is something that is actually ingrained in us. And this is where I think being able to actually do the work and sorting through it and processing it is such a big step in moving through it, I guess, and succeeding and fulfilling what your calling is. And that's kind of where good for you for like setting aside everything because like it's not like a PhD is a long way to go to be investing the time the finances and then basically saying no this isn't my calling I know what my calling is and going after that and I know because like even for myself like when I've gone through other traumas or tragedies through life one of the biggest things that I have resorted to was becoming like a workaholic Mm -hmm. and avoidance and (laughs) not actually going through and processing it. And I think so many of us do this without actually realizing that this is a way of us avoiding something or avoiding doing the hard work. And that's where I think you come in where people that aren't able to always process their emotions or don't even really know where to start. This is the perfect opportunity for them to touch base with you or talk to someone that knows that's been through it, number one, and then that also knows how to help them facilitate through the next steps and the next stages, because it is an ongoing process. Whether you are already on the other side of it, it's always like a process that you still have to keep at it. It's not something that, okay, once you've like gone through it, it's never going to trigger itself or it's never going to come back. It's ongoing that you need to nurture yourself through that. And I think this is where you have absolutely found your calling because we've worked together for other youth retreats, mental wellness retreats, and you absolutely love on people, (laughs) share with them the right tools and different tools that they may not have even known about. Uh, to basically support them for their anxiety, understanding self-hate, being compassionate towards them, as well as nurturing self-love relationships. So I guess based off of that, can you maybe tell us why is it that we feel anxious or what might trigger an anxious thought or a panic attack in in some way? Yeah. So there's, I mean, there's lots of different individual reasons it could happen, but what I've found is like the the underlying like crux of it, right? The di- the deeper I dug within myself and the deeper I dig like with, with my clients, that usually it comes back to just our minds trying to protect us from, from pain. And usually that pain is trauma or stress or something that we've experienced in the past. And by trauma, I, I just want to clarify that that word here. It's like everyone experiences trauma, every single human on the planet. It's part of the human experience. And trauma is literally just any stress that you've experienced that's a bit bigger than you can handle or a lot bigger. So it just means that, you know, maybe you didn't have the coping skills or the support system or just you as a you as a human in that moment like the stress felt bigger than you. That's what, that's what trauma is. And it could be anything uh, like as small as having experienced, you know, bullying in school. And that's not very small. That's actually, you know, something really significant that can impact us so much. I know I experienced a lot of bullying and if there's any kids or like parents listening to this with kids, I mean, I know you have children too, that like, that is, that is a trauma. And so, so are bigger things like me having an alcoholic father or people passing away or, or car accidents or other kinds of accidents and loss. And, um, the pandemic, for example, is really traumatic for a lot of people because it's a very big change, a very big shift, a big thing of stress. And so usually anxiety is a response to, to our minds trying to protect ourselves from experiencing trauma again. So when we're born, like as little babies, we, we are so much more, I guess, pure, you could say. We haven't ha- experienced a whole lot of, of of stress and a whole lot of pain yet. But then as we grow up, so through our childhood, through our teenage years, as we're, we're developing, if we experience 
even things like not having gotten enough um, love or acceptance from your parents. If your parents were kind of hard on you, if you did lose people in um, while you were growing up, if you, um, even as an adult, I have um, a client who experienced like a traumatic uh, childbirth. And after that, she ended up experiencing um, a lot more anxiety um, because of like the a fear around trauma in her and her child. So really it's, it's just our brains kind of going into overdrive in reaction to pain or to try to protect us from pain or try to protect us from experiencing trauma or too much stress again. So it's really, um, it's really that like, it's a reaction to, to like survival and protection and kind of adaptation. Um, and it can also be, um, rather than it being like to a specific event or a specific trigger that, you know, maybe reminds you of memories of that kind of event, it can also just be a symptom of, hey, there's a lot of stress stored within your body. So it can be like little amounts of trauma over time that just like build up until, you know, the thermometer gets to a certain point and it like, and it bursts or it spills over. So um, it could even, it could be things like people not accepting you or being very judgmental for a long amount of time. And then you become paranoid about people like thinking bad things about you and you worry about the judgments of others or um, you haven't been giving yourself enough care and enough nurturing for enough time. Um, and so you're, you're physically maybe not doing very well. You're like mentally not doing very well. And so then the anxiety will, will be like a manifestation of like those imbalances. Um, and so there's, yeah, so there's a couple of different, um, a couple of different reasons. And I want to also bring this back to like the, the generational trauma, right? I said that when we're like born as kids, we're like more pure, but we also are, as we grow up, we're carrying a lot of the weight of, of our families. So if our parents are, you know, traumatized, uh, traumatized people walking around in human skins, which we honestly all are. And if we haven't all done, um, the healing work, the inner work, like you were talking about, then we, we are carrying some of this, a lot of this trauma or this unhealed parts with us. And so when we're, even when we're kids, we could be experiencing the, the, I guess, echoes of what is coming from our parents and our grandparents because of their own behaviors, the things that they say, and it all like adds up, if that makes sense. Um, so there's a, a lot of different, a lot of different reasons. I mean, I think this is why like going through this journey with someone else, like with me or just with any other guide in general, whether like it's a healer, a coach, a therapist, like whoever you work with. Um, I think it's really important to have that other person because it can be really hard to see that within your own life. And I've had mentors along the way and coaches along the way and all of that too, and therapists and, and have gotten help from so many other people. Getting help often is the hardest first step. Um, but it's important to have that, I think, that person on the outside to see like, okay, where has this come from for you? Um, rather than trying to do it yourself, because when you're in the middle of it, it can be really hard to see. And it's also hard for, it just makes it harder on yourself to be questioning like, well, why do I have this? Why am I feeling anxious? Um, when rather it's more important to just invite acceptance around the fact that you're feeling anxious or that you're struggling with anxiety or any other kind of struggle because it's okay that you have it. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing broken. It is a sign that there's probably some healing or lifestyle changes or inner work that can be done to help you feel better. But it doesn't mean that like there's things wrong with you or you shouldn't have it or you screwed up because you are experiencing it. Um, so I want to make that note too. So people don't feel like ashamed for having it. Cause I definitely was in that place where I felt ashamed, like, Oh, was I not going through life? Right. Did I screw up? Um, and it's no, it's just, it's how our brains adapt and, and survive and, and adapt patterns that, you know, might've helped us get through trauma or, or tragedy earlier on that just now, instead of helping us are hurting us. Like it just becomes, it becomes, uh, an amount that ends up interrupting our lives instead of helping us, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's so true. Like, cause even when we are born, I guess, even depending on how we're born, whether it's like a natural birth or you're 
you also have uh, trauma at birth because if it's like a c-section a lot of babies are being pulled out like aggressively or different ways and that's kind of where starting at birth you can be experiencing trauma Mm -hmm. Um, even throughout birth um, you can be experiencing trauma and that's where I think it was in one of your other podcasts actually where you had talked about um, people asking for help and the fear of asking for help or Mm -hmm. them feeling overwhelmed and saying okay I can't ask for help and this is something that maybe when they were younger children if they had asked like their parents for help with a homework or an assignment that the parents at that point were saying, okay, I don't have time for this or no, just do it all yourself. Like you have to figure it out on your own. And this is something where we're telling you now, you don't need to do this on your own. Like there are people like yourself to support you on this journey. And this is something where be proud of the fact that you are able to ask for help and do that because I think we need to get over the stigma where it's like, I'm struggling and I need to figure this out on my own because there are so many people in the same boat as us and that we need to be able to talk about it and talk about it openly as well as get the help that we need because everyone experiences trauma on different levels, whether it be anxiety or whether it be trauma through tragedy and being okay with asking for that help is only the first step to supporting yourself and loving yourself. So that's kind of one of the most important things is like we have things that are ingrained in us even as we're getting older that we don't realize that how important these decisions are for our long-term growth I guess yeah. <laughs> so it's and like I yeah I read like so many I think self-help books <laughs> it's like so overwhelming like, times yeah and I I want to speak to anyone who who does feel ashamed or feels a lot of resistance to getting help because I was in that boat. I mean, I shared my, my story about how, you know, I was a, I was an overachiever. I was extremely motivated. Um, and that was honestly an adaptation to me not being supported enough. Um, I did everything myself. I was, you know, making money and having my own jobs already at like 13, 14 years old. I was the oldest sibling. Um, and I, was very independent from a very young age and, you know, wise beyond my years, honestly, because I got accelerated through my childhood because of my dad being an alcoholic and not being a very good parent. Um, And then me almost having to step in for myself and then for my other siblings, that made me a very independent person. Or when I would ask for help with homework or like you were saying, or even, even just small things, I was rejected because my mom didn't have enough time because she was making up for all of the things that my dad wasn't doing because he was, he was drinking. Right. So she had to like do so much just to keep the family to together and to keep us, keep us okay. And so I had to be really independent. So then when it came to realizing that I was struggling and asking, asking for help from getting help from a a therapist or, or even, even turning to, to, to books or like now I have for, for my business, I have a, like a business coach and all of that, like getting help for me was, was so scary because when I had asked for help, when I was younger, my dad would choose alcohol instead of me. Right. Or I would have to step up and help my mom out or help my siblings out because because of the, like the tragedies and and stuff I, I experienced, or even if speaking to anyone who, you know, may not have had an alcoholic parent or like a very dysfunctional family, even if you had parents that just pushed you to be very, very independent before you were ready and they didn't give you the help that you needed. And not that there's anything wrong with what they did. They, they probably just didn't know better, right? We can't, I, I had to release a lot of blame from my parents through this healing journey. Um, but it's like, I struggled to get help. And that was normal because when I had asked for help before I was turned away. Right. And I experienced all that pain. So when I needed the help, people weren't there. And so I had assumed like I need to do it myself. Um, and I, 
experienced a lot of shame or, you know, got yelled at or something when I would ask for help in the past, or even um, if I bring this to like some of the relationships that I was in with very toxic partners, when I had spoken up for myself, I was shamed, right? I was, I had partnerships with some very narcissistic and abusive people. And so that's what made it really hard to ask for help. So anyone who's like experiencing resistance to it, that doesn't mean that it's wrong to ask for help. You just might have been shown that you might have experienced a lot of pain around asking for help. So it's okay to experience the resistance to it, but I need you to like push through that and realize that there, there isn't anything wrong with it. You just need to get help from the right people and that there are a lot of people with, with love and healing and compassion to share um, even if you have experienced a lot of people who haven't been that for you, it doesn't mean that they don't exist. Absolutely. And I know right now there's a lot of stress and anxiousness and fear going on in the world um, where a lot of people are just cocooning and drawing back in. So mm -hmm. how can we support ourselves when we feel anxious? Yeah, I think the first thing, like I was saying earlier, is just is just recognizing that you're feeling that way, like re whatever your reaction might be, whether it's retreating inward, or maybe you're experiencing, you know, a panic attack, or you are experiencing a lot of anxious thoughts, overthinking, whatever the symptoms are that you're experiencing, whatever struggle you have, I think the first step is just accepting that you are experiencing it, and that it's okay, like whatever, whatever behavior that you had, whether it's drawing inward or not talking to people or not asking for help, like whatever mistake you feel like you've made or whatever um, anxiety you're experiencing, like it's okay. It's okay to be struggling. It's okay to have um, behaved that way. It's okay to have thought that to have thought that way that doesn't define you. And it's also too important to recognize that that's just, that's just how you're coping and however you're coping is it, it's okay. And I understand that, you know, there's a lot of like unhealthy ways to cope, right? Like my dad, went, when my dad was an alcoholic or when I was overworking or when um, uh, all these unhealthy kind of coping mechanisms or like drawing inward and not speaking to anyone, right? That's not great for us overall, but it's something that we all need to accept that we do as humans um, and like forgive ourselves for and to not judge ourselves for whatever whatever we have done or the anxiety that we have. Um, and to realize that we're not broken, it's just we are human. So I think that's definitely the first step is just to realize like it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to have done something, you know, quote unquote, like wrong or not healthy or not good for ourselves. Um, because we're we're just all humans living on this on this planet, like trying to figure life out. Um, and the, the next thing is arming yourself with not arming yourself, I guess, arming yourself with, with a good, with a good toolbox to deal with anxiety and stress for me that it was really important to have a, it was, and is really important to have a very wide variety of different kinds of coping tools. Cause there are moments where, um, meditation like feels really great for me. And there are other moments where I cannot sit down. Um, and so I will instead do different kinds of energetic practices like shaking my body or dancing around. And that's what Zareen was saying earlier in this podcast. Like I literally dance, move and shake um, anxiety off or like emotions off. Um, that's, that's a practice that I use. And a lot of videos on my Instagram include that and um, other kinds of skills like, like journaling, um, different types of breathing techniques, different types of mindfulness practices, um, and using my senses, whether it's outdoors or whether it's like while eating or drinking um, and and so many other different kinds of of coping techniques and having that like really big toolbox is just it's so helpful because there you need different tools in different seasons um, to help. Oh, just other other kinds of tools, even things like um, taking some time to do nothing. Take, I know Zareen, you're a big user of essential oils, um, using things like essential oils or candles um, to like center yourself or ground yourself. Um, I'm someone who I love using essential oils in like, in like a bath and 
Um, the reason that I mentioned all those other coping skills and not like, I don't know, taking a bath and skincare and all of those other things that are typically thought of, thought of as self-care is because those things are kind of supplemental for me, like taking a bath or, um, or like skincare and stuff like that. Whereas the other things like meditation, breath work, mindfulness, energetic practices, journaling, like those are the true things that like help me care for myself when I'm feeling anxious or stressed and also on the in-between, right? So they're not just to be used when you're feeling really anxious or really stressed. They're, there's things that I practice all the time, even when I'm feeling really great, because then it helps prepare me and for those moments when things like a pandemic happens or like when, when, when stress really does um, like come at you really hard, right? When a wave of, of life tries to knock you down, like if you're armed with that whole toolbox, one, you're just in a more grounded and like calm place to start with. And also if you do get knocked down, you can get up a lot faster, right? Because you have so many different tools to choose from. So I think that that is so important. Um, and not that there isn't a place for um, therapy or like healing sessions or um, medication, but I know that there are a lot of people out there and especially those who listen to this podcast who are looking for things um, things beyond that, right. And like lifestyle changes they could make so that, um, anxiety is less present overall. Right. And it becomes, and we become a lot better at regulating our emotions and our mind and, and all of that. And so I think that that is, that is really important and something that I, um, teach and actually I'm launching today. I don't know when you'll re be releasing this podcast, but, um, as we're recording this today, I'm launching a, um, a coping skills course that people can, um, can get if that's something that they want to do, like, and learn all of these different coping skills so that they can fill up their toolbox and be more independent and resilient to stress and um, be armed with so many different holistic tools to deal with stress and anxiety. I think that's so important that you have to have all of those different tools because each person has like their own tools that they have like a calling towards or that they care for more. They're willing to spend their time and invest in that. And I think that's so important because what may work for one person, they may not enjoy that tool. For example, mm -hmm. journaling. Journaling is something that I have always done. Like even as like a kid, I'm sure like almost all of us had like little diaries and stuff. And this is something that we did as like younger children, but then we put that aside for so long and then now it's kind of we're getting back into the routine and being able to express our emotions and I know for people that are journaling one of the things that I know a lot of people have a fear of oh, okay well if someone reads this or I don't want other people to get into my journal one of the things that I always offer them is like what you can always do is write it down or like even if you put it as a text message to yourself and just put it on paper and either burn it or delete it without actually having it physically there is always an option because I find as soon as you write it down or get it out of your mind that process something whether people realize it or not where they don't always have to communicate it to someone else just even the thought of putting pen to paper is a big thing and I find that for myself that's one of the things that is beneficial for me as well for if I'm going through something or if I want to process an emotion I always find that like I'll either write it to myself in a text message and then just delete it that way I've kind of put it out to the world and I'm also I guess maintaining my privacy in that aspect <laughs> yeah and uh, that that's something that I've I've heard from other people too is them saying well what if someone finds my journal, um, and I mean I think I think part of the healing journey is also recognizing that what anyone else thinks about you is doesn't it it doesn't mean anything about you right if anyone is judging you for for what you're writing or how you're feeling or what you're thinking. That means they probably also have a lot of judgment towards themselves. So that's one thing is just to note that like anything that anyone's thinking about you doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. It usually means that there's some something that they have to work through themselves. And also that's why having all those other different kinds of techniques are so important. Um, and actually when I was um, in addition to like just, you know, writing in a traditional like diary or notebook or journal, 
um, something that I did a lot of that would help is just writing on a piece of paper, like things that were on my mind, things that I needed to do. So writing down like to-do lists on paper, writing down, um, like if I'm processing something, almost writing, like writing a letter to the person and then you can burn it or throw away and never have that conversation with a person if you're not, if you don't want to have that conversation, but it's just something you've been ruminating over. Um, that's great to do. And, uh, something that I really like is an oral form of journaling is I will record voice messages to myself, like pretend I'm talking on the phone to another person and just speak out all of my thoughts that way. Um, and that's something, obviously, if anyone's worried about it being heard, you can, you can delete it. Right. But just getting it out of your, out of your mind, um, can be really helpful, right. To like, look at it, to process it. Um, and then there are so many other ways to um, release something from your mind, like through breathwork or meditation or to release emotions. I really love using dance and movement and different kinds of energetic practices to release emotions or to release like those those things that feel really stuck within us or to process because our, our bodies are so wise and and know how to do it. We just have to figure out how to tap into that. Um, and once I figured out how to do that, like that was, that was so great. And, um, I also know, just want to note for anyone who like feels like they, sh they should be able to journal or that should feel easy, or they should be able to write all that stuff out. Sometimes that's just not the right thing. And that's also okay, which is why it's important to have so many different, so many different methods and there's no wrong way to do anything. Um, and again, inviting that acceptance in and not trying to put ourselves into a certain box because every single moment, every season, every person like may require something different. Um, and, and that's, that's totally okay. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I love is how you address each of the areas in our life, because anxiety may be temporary for someone or it might be something that's deeply ingrained in them but you basically bring it down to clarity care contribution creativity capability and consistency and those are the things that I think when we're talking about healing and being able to process these areas in our lives that's kind of where I think those six components are so important um, so I guess based off of that what would be the most important tip that you can give someone that would resonate with our listeners for them to support themselves to nurture themselves to a new you I would say that the the biggest thing that anyone listening to this um, that I want you to realize and that I want you to know is that you are worthy of living life differently. And just because you've been experiencing anxiety or you've gone through a lot of struggles and tragedies or trauma or never, maybe you never experienced what it's like to, to live with a lot of clarity or to live like free from those struggles or to actually feel like peace and, and joy and, and fulfillment and all of that. If even if that's something that you've never experienced, like that is something you are still worthy of. And even if you don't know how to get there, but you know, what's something that you want, you, you deserve it. And everyone, everyone does, because I've had, I've had people come to me and say, well, but I've been anxious my whole life, or this is how I've always lived. So how could it be any different? And I hope that, you know, I serve as an example that it can be different. Um, and also just know for you that even if it's something you've never been free from, that there is a way to, to get out of it. And you have to believe that you have to believe that you, you can like live differently, that you are worthy of like being happy and not struggling so much anymore, that you are worthy of, of getting, of getting out of it and, and having a life that you're really like proud of and happy to live and, and feeling content in and feeling powerful in. And that's something that every single human on this planet deserves. And I, I truly believe, um, and it is my mission to make sure that every single person has a like mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually like healthy and happy life. That is something that every single human on this earth 
um, absolutely deserves. And even if you haven't been shown that, even if you haven't experienced that, like that's okay. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not meant for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I guess with a lot of us now with the pandemic and everything, whether we're working from home or managing families or just surviving, um, yeah. I know a lot of us feel like we're in overdrive. So mm-hmm. I guess what are some tips for us to thrive while we're in overdrive? Hmm. Um, I, I think the, this connects back to the worthiness thing, but just realizing that, Hey, what you're doing is enough, um, that it's okay to have bad days. It's okay to feel like you're struggling. Um, there is, I don't know anyone, anyone who has it all together. And I think we, we have this image of everyone like having it all together and being able to handle everything well, um, when that's really, everyone has a struggle in, in some way, even if, if you're su- successful, like looking successful on the outside, whether it's financially, mentally, emotionally, that there are still days when, when you struggle, like there, I still have many moments when I do, I would say that I am um, much more healed than I was several years ago, but there are still moments when I have really low days or when I, when, when anxiety seems a bit more severe or harder to, to get under control. And just even on those days, like, it's okay. There are things, there are things that happen, right? Like a pandemic hits and you're, you're just trying to like navigate all this newness and all this change and all these things you never experienced before. And however you are getting through it, like is that, that, that is okay. And I want you to congratulate yourself for like making it through another day, like take it one day at a time um, beat yourself up things not being the way they used to be, or things not always being good because any bad days that you have are not taking away from any of the good days that you have ever had. Um, and it's not like you're, you're never going backwards. That's another thing I hear a lot is people worry that they're, um, that they're losing progress or they're going backwards or their life is getting worse. And, Um, I don't, I don't believe that to be the truth because I've noticed that whenever I've had, you know, a breakdown, it actually ends up being a really big breakthrough because I realized something, oh, here, this is something now I get to shift or it taught me a really big lesson. I know that's hard to realize like when you're stuck in the middle of the mud and you're stuck in that moment, but just know that it is like, you're, you're always moving forward. You're always like, you're always growing and, and this like low period that you're in right now, or the, the mud that you feel like feels really sticky right now, like it, it's okay. It's temporary. You're going to get through it. You're going to learn so much from it. Um, and it's going to like all those things that you experience, like all the tragedies that I've experienced have brought me to the person that I am today. And I wouldn't be me without all of that, right. Ha- without having experienced all of that. And so, um, yeah, I hope that those are, I think some, some piece of pieces of advice that I hope lifts some weight off of, um, off of you, anyone who's listening to this, that like you're, you're doing your best and that, that is enough. That is absolutely enough. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I love that, that take your break down and make it into your breakthrough. I think that's so key, um, that I hope everyone takes that away where my hope is that from this conversation, more people talk about anxiety, mental wellness, mental fitness, and all these taboo topics that have a stigma associated with them, and that we start lifting that off. So Jessica, do we have time for like a quick five minute meditation? Because I would love for you to guide all of our listeners to get an opportunity to experience one of your meditations. Yeah, I'd love to do that. And I think that's going to be great, especially after we've had you know, a pretty heavy conversation or maybe a conversation for, for anyone listening to this, that is bringing up a lot of awareness in you. And it's, it's bringing, maybe it's bringing up even more anxiousness within you, um, which is totally okay. Um, so I hope that this helps, helps ground you. So, um, if you're driving, please do not, uh, follow along with the guided meditation (laughs) or save it for later. But if you are in a place where you can sit down or lay down, then, please do so. And this is just going to take a couple minutes. And just for, for a second, I want you to shake, if you feel the need to um, shake out any energy out of your legs or out of your hands, 
you know, move your head around. You can roll, um, roll your neck gently from side to side, whatever you feel like needs to come out. Or if you're just ready to sit still, you can sit still. Um, but I know that I need to get a little bit of extra movement out before we get still. And now, so either seated or laying down, I just want you to start by focusing on a point in front of you um, and just starting to soften your focus um, and bring your awareness to lots of things that are around you. And I'm going to take a couple deep breaths. So inhaling through the nose, exhaling through the mouth. Inhale, exhale, and on this next exhale, you can close your eyes or keep your eyes open if that feels safer. Now I want you to feel the connection between your body and the surface beneath you. Feel the connection of your feet and your hips to that surface. And tune into any sounds around you, whether that's the sound of my voice, sound of things outdoors or in the room with you. the sound of your own breathing. Maybe there are things that you can smell or feel. Just tuning into our senses and getting a sense of where we are right now. Now I want you to tune back into your your body and the and the connection to the surface beneath you to your environment. And as you pay attention to your body, you might be feeling how your breath is moving your body. Maybe your chest is rising and falling. Your shoulders are moving. If you have trouble feeling how your breath is moving, you can put your hands on your stomach or on your chest. And now I just want you to follow the rise and fall of your breath. Notice how each one is a little different. No need to control it or change it. We're just following it. Feeling the waves of your breath move your body up and down. Expand and contract. And anytime you start to drift off thinking about something that's totally fine, just come right back to following what your breathing is doing and observing it. Now we're going to take a couple conscious breaths. So we're going to deepen the breath a little bit. So inhale a little more deeply. Exhale. Inhale a little deeper. Exhale. And the deepest breath you have taken all day. All 
right, now you can let your breathing go back to normal. Start to tune in to the sounds around you again. Maybe you wanna to start to wake up your body, wiggle your fingers and toes. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes and come back to us. Mm. Oh, even just those five minutes, I feel more grounded, more alert. Um, yeah, definitely feel a lot less thoughts bouncing around my brain. And just to anyone who, even if you still have thoughts bouncing around or if that didn't feel very good, like I said, sometimes meditation feels great. Sometimes it is not the right thing for you in this moment, and that is okay. It doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. It just may mean that you need something different. And if you really enjoyed this, um, I have uh, lots of guided meditations um, in the, my product called Meditations for Anxiety, which we can definitely um, link or get you access to, or you can totally reach out to me and ask about it. But I hope that you guys enjoyed that and you enjoyed that just a couple of minutes for you and for yourself and just those couple of minutes of, of quiet. Yeah, it was absolutely beautiful. And that's what I love doing for myself. I love doing meditations either before I go to sleep because it just kind of soothes me and gets me in the mood to sleep or I'll do it as kind of like an afternoon pick me up where like after a lunch slump where you need to kind of get refocused, where it just kind of gives you like a 10 or a 15 or a 20 minute break and yeah. it just re-energizes you. And that's where yeah. it's like and five minutes can make such an impact to your day. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be anything um, really complicated either. Like there's so many different ways to meditate, whether it's following your breath or tuning into your senses or um, different kinds of visualizations. Like there's lots of different um, subsections, I guess you could say of meditation, or you can even do it while, while walking. Um, don't do it while driving, but you can totally do it while walking and like being mindful and tuning into your senses while walking or focusing on your breathing while you walk, um, or just even the rhythm of your steps, like all of those are different kinds of meditative techniques and something that, um, while I was still a grad student, that helped me like get through those last um, that last year or so of grad school was taking multiple breaks throughout the day to like reground myself because, you know, the work I was doing, especially because it was something that I knew I didn't want to do anymore, but I was kind of just finishing up for the sake of closing um, some loose ends. It like helped me so much to just take five or 10 minutes at a time and yeah, it doesn't have to take a lot of time. It doesn't have to be done at a certain time of day. Like just whenever you feel like you need a little more centering, um, definitely do it. And I've been uh, practicing meditation so regularly that if I don't do it for a couple of days and um, I'll start to uh, get a little more snappy or more emotional around my partner, he'll like actually sit down and be like, hey, do you want to do a meditation together? <laughs> and so it's a great tool to like turn to um, when you realize like, you know, you just need some centering or your, maybe your emotions are getting a little, um, a little, not out of hand, but just when, when, when you feel a little more scattered and you just need to like come back to you, um, it's a great way to come back to yourself. Absolutely. And I guess we will link everything below for all the listeners to be able to get a hold of all of your beautiful podcasts, all of these meditations. But do you have any other plans that are coming up for yourself as an anxiety relief coach? I know you'd er mentioned earlier, you're planning on putting together a new program and a course, anything that we should be keeping an eye out for? Yeah, so right now, um, so over the next couple weeks, um, I'm going to be launching the uh, my coping skills course. And along with that, so that's going to be teaching um, lots of different coping skills that I talked about in here and more. I'm really helping you like build the foundation to um, to break free from anxiety, like holding you back from like living your life. Because once you have that under your under control, I guess you could say, or just not taking over anymore, like you can do so much more, right? You can excel more in your relationships. You can excel more in your career. Like once you are grounded and once you are good, like it gives you the foundation for so much more growth. 
um, and to just live life so much more fully. And um, also coming up, I'll be having a virtual a virtual live event over a weekend. So a weekend retreat that's going to be focusing on recharging and like discovering yourself. Um, I have one-on-one um, healing containers available as well if anyone wants to do that deeper work with me. Um, and coming up, I'm also working on um, a mastermind, which is a hybrid one-on-one and group program. Um, so if people want to want to heal, want to um, work on their relationships, um, make career changes, um, want to heal, heal the anxiety they're experiencing, um, work on like discovering themselves and becoming more accepting and loving towards themselves and, and being surrounded by people who are also growing in the same way. Um, that mastermind will be coming up in a couple, in a month or so. Um, and it's called the meant for more mastermind. So, so many projects kind of in the works in so many different ways to work with me. Um, and long term, um, I'm planning on doing, yeah, like keynote speaking or speaking engagements. Um, there may be an app in the works that I'm creating, um, a product line. So, so many different things, um, so many different ways that my business and I'm hoping that my impact on everyone can grow. So, yeah, lots of different ways. So, keep an eye out for all of those magical things. That's amazing. I love that. And I love the name meant for you as well. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, because that's awesome. So we'll link everything below. But I guess what is the best way for people to connect with you? Because you do your one on one coaching, should they yeah. schedule a one on one coaching call with you first, and then understand what would be best suited for them? Or are they able to just kind of pick and choose? Yeah, so I, there, there's lots of different ways to connect with me. If you want to like, chat with me, um, really just connect with me like casually, or even if it's to reach out about anything that I can help you with, um, you can reach out to me by, by email, um, on my Instagram. So that's at Jessica.Stephanie16 and we'll link all that stuff. So you don't have to remember how to spell it or anything. Um, and yeah, so you can reach out to me by email or Instagram. Um, we can also include like, if you want to, um, like actually apply to work with me in some way and you already know like, Hey, I want to work with you. Or I want, um, you want my help. Then we can include like an application, um, to like, that would be almost for like a consultation call. Um, or I, I think the best way is just, Hey, reach out to me, say you want to figure out what it is that you need, or you can even just get one of the things, my courses or meditations or something like that, that you need directly. So there's lots of different avenues um, that will link below, or you can get to from my Instagram or from my email, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, there's so many different ways and I don't want anyone to feel restricted or like they need to dive into work with me right away either. Like, Hey, if you just want to connect and you, um, uh, if you just want to chat, I'm so open to just connecting with you as like a fellow human too. That's awesome. I love that. And I guess anything else that you wanted to add or close out the today's podcast? Um, no, I think we covered so much and obviously we could talk for like so much, <laughs> so much longer. Like I think this conversation can just go on forever. Um, but yeah, I just want to thank you for, for having me and for allowing me to share, um, what it is that I do. And also just, I think hopefully bringing some, some hope and some light and some love to anyone who's listening to this. I, yeah, I want to thank anyone listening to this, uh, for being here and for taking the time to listen and for, um, surrounding yourself with exactly what it is that you need in the moment that you're in right now. Absolutely. Yeah. Jessica, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today mm -hmm. on Conversations with Zareen. I hope each of you guys have benefited from this conversation as well as with the beautiful meditation that was short and sweet. And we will catch you next time. Thank you. You've been listening to Conversations with Zareen. For show notes, episode guides, and resources, drop in at www.lifebyzareen.com. You can follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest under Life by Zareen. Thank you and have a wonderful time.